have your Bible tonight, you'll find our text in the book of Malachi. And uh, it's not real hard to find. Last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. I want to share with you a few thoughts from the book of Malachi tonight. We're going to be in chapter number three, Malachi chapter number three. Malachi chapter number three. I still hear some pages turning. Might be some of those pages stuck together. You may not visit these passages as often as some others, but all word is given by inspiration of God. All the scriptures is profitable. All of it is. Let's stand together tonight, Malachi chapter three, and I want to share with you a couple of verses tonight, and we'll go back and see what the Lord would have for us. Malachi chapter number three, verse number one, the word of God says, behold, I will send my messenger And he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. We'll stop here, Brother Jerry. Would you pray for us, please? Thank you, you may be seated. When we study our Bibles, we quickly observe that there's some books of the Bibles that are longer and many more chapters than some of the others. And when it comes to the prophets, the prophets are only, uh, they're all uh, categorized as the minor and the major prophets. And I used to think it was because of the message, but it's not. It's because of the length of the message that God's given them. And Malachi has been classified amongst those that are called the minor prophets. Uh, But yet, even though that he's considered to be a minor prophet, God has given him a major message that is important and relevant, not only for his time and generation, but for us just as well. The book of Malachi is a small book, only contains four chapters, but as a, a, a major message in this book. When we think about the book of Malachi, what I have read tonight in chapter number three, verses one and two, they are the key verses of this book and the whole idea behind the Lord inspiring this to, and given to Malachi is to, for the people to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Uh, the prophets have been prophesying of old, and they have spoke about his coming. Uh, even the first prophecy given there, the proto evangelica the go- first gospel in Genesis 3 and 15, we uh, see it carried out, and, and uh, um, uh, prophet after prophet, message after message is that the Lord's coming. And now that uh, the stage is ready and it's getting close for the Lord's first come, uh, first coming, first appearing, and the fulfillment of the scripture, Malachi has been instructed of God for the people to get ready for his coming. Uh, the book can be divided into two major divisions. Uh, chapters 1 and 2 has the, uh, the dealing with the condition of the people. And then chapter 3 and chapter number 4 deals with the coming of the Lord. Uh, we've looked at some of those verses in the past. By way of introduction tonight, I want to share with you about five thoughts about the book of Malachi, and we'll get a little bit further into the text. First of all, that this book has been referred to as a closing book, and by that, it's the 39th book in the the Bible. It is the last book of the Old Testament uh, that Malachi was uh, the last uh, uh, prophetic messenger of God before there was a period of 400 silent years. Uh, He had the last prophetic message of God before there was that period of 400 silent years. And when after that uh, God had Malachi to lay down his pen, there wasn't any new prophecies being given. 
There wasn't any uh, other prophets that was on the stage during that 400 period of silent years. You say, well, what was people doing? I'll tell you what they was doing. Uh, rather than receiving some new prophecy, they had to go back and, and see what God had previously said. As you know, we, uh, we're living in a day and generation when there's a lot of uh, phonies and a lot of quacks out there. And there's so many that saying that I've got a special revelation from God. When you read the Bible, that no part of prophecy is of a private interpretation. Uh, God doesn't uh, just give. And somebody said, well, uh, that uh, this angel appeared out in the wilderness and there was these plates and his message was written on them. And this is what God told me to give the people. And you say, where's the angel? The angel's gone. Where's the plates? The plates are gone. Well, who can confirm that message? Nobody. Listen, that no prophecy is a private interpretation. When you find these prophets, they weren't lone rangers out there, that God may use one here and one here and one here. But all of them had the same message that harmonize and come together. Beware of those. Those that say, well, I have a, a new prophecy of God. No, he has already spoken. Uh, God's given us a full revelation of his word. And we don't need any new word. We've got God's word. We can go back to the Old Testament, the New Testament. And we have been fully equipped with everything we need to be able to navigate for the life that God's given us. Amen. Going back to what thus saith the Lord. Uh, whenever we think about this closing book, it's a connecting book. And by that, you have it's the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, but it links and ties the Old Testament together with the New Testament. Whenever we read tonight in chapter number 3, Behold, I will send my messenger, that these verses are speaking about John the Baptist, a time when God would send the forerunner who would prepare the way. He said, Make ye the, the way straight, uh, that there's one coming. And he was pointing to Jesus, and, he, and uh, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, he was a wild man, and he was... Uh, dressed in a different way and eat a uh, ho- uh, locust and uh, honey and and uh, he was um, a little different in his approach and and uh, many looked at him but he was a voice that was crying in the wilderness and he said it's not about me he said I'm not worthy to even unloose but he says it's him and he said behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world now when I think about uh, uh, John the Baptist uh, and uh, uh, him uh, going to be coming that I read over, we find here the prophecy that the messenger is going to come and he's going to prepare the way. Uh, Then when we turn in our Bibles to the New Testament and uh, in the book of Luke in particular, uh, Luke chapter number one, I'll share with you a few thoughts here. And we see the fulfillment of this prophecy that was given of Malachi in Luke chapter number one, Luke chapter number one. And verse number five, we read there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. We read over in verse number 6, and he speaks about Zacharias and Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Verse number 7, And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. It came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. I love verse number 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without uh, at the time of incense. What's a blessing to see the people come together to pray. Amen. And they were praying and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar. The right side is always associated with that of power and authority. His angels coming in the power and authority of heaven. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Verse number 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now, we, we, if we're not careful, we'll just simply read through these verses, not realize the significance of what's going on here. Zacharias, he's ministering in the temple. He's burning incense, and this is part of his uh, duties and responsibilities. And all of a sudden, one day, something's different. There's an angel of the Lord appears, and standing on the right side of the altar, and Zacharias is fearful, and he, and he, and he says, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Now, can you imagine tonight if an angel showed up in the time of our worship in the Lord and our time of sacrifice and uh, said, uh, Your prayer is heard. First of all, I'd say, thank the Lord. But secondly, I'd say, which prayer? Yeah. Wouldn't you say, which prayer is it? Because there's a lot of prayers being offered up. But you don't have to wonder about which one because he tells him, he says, you and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a son. 
and you're going to call his name John. Now, whenever I read these verses, I'm thinking to myself that uh, when you read on down, you'll find that Zacharias is kind of surprised by this because him and his wife Elizabeth are now well stricken in years beyond childbearing age. And so I don't believe that it's something that they have been praying about in the last little bit. I think really what's happening here is there was a point in time in Zacharias and Elizabeth's life that they started asking God in heaven to give them a child. In particular, they probably prayed that God would give them a son because they wanted somebody to be able to carry on the family name and to carry on the family legacy. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and nothing's happening. And they prayed more and weeks turned into months and months turned into years and years after years. And finally, one day they look in the mirror and say, you know what? Said, I think that we might as well quit praying about this and we might as well accept that it's not God's will for us to have children. By the way, look at us and we're in no shape now to be able to raise a little kid and all this that we're uh, on up in years. Uh, but yet we find that God had heard their prayer back when they prayed it. And, and now God says that I never told you no, he said, but it just wasn't the right time. But thy prayer is heard, and I'm going to give you a son, and you're going to call his name John. And here's some things about John that you need to know. Uh, we read in verse number 14, and they, thou shalt have joy uh, and uh, gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready to, listen, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We read in verse number 18, And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. First of all, let me pause here and say Zechariah was not only an old man, but he was a wise man. Here's why I say he's wise, because he said, I am an old man, and he didn't say I'm an old man and my wife's an old woman. He said, I'm an old man and my wife is well stricken in years. He was very careful how he worded what he was about to say. And so we can learn a lot from Zechariah's wisdom that he carefully selected his word. But he said, how shall we know? And we know that uh, there were some things happened after that. But really what this was, was it was a, a, an answer to the prophecy that God had given Malachi, uh, telling him that there's a forerunner who's coming and a forerunner would be none other than John the Baptist. Now, what's interesting is this book, Malachi, is a connecting book. Uh, we find that Malachi prophesies of John the Baptist, the, the New Testament, all of a sudden he's here, and this is the key that links them together. Uh, I, I heard one time a lady told me, she said that she attended a church where her pastor never, ever, ever preached out of the Old Testament. And I told her, I said, surely he does. Maybe it's just been a time when you wasn't there. She said, no. She said, I went and talked to him about it. And he said there wasn't any need to preach out of the Old Testament because God's given us the new. Can I tell you tonight that the new wasn't to replace the old. The old concealed is the new revealed. They go hand in hand. Thank God for the full counsel of God's word, the old and the new. I remember whenever I was young, I had one of them little view masters and it was a little a camera looking type thing. And, and uh, you put these little cards in the top and you could click it and it would turn and uh, have pictures. And you looked through it, you had two lens. Your right eye looked through the right lens and your left eye looked through the left lens. Uh, you're looking through two different lens, but when you look through there, you didn't see two different pictures. You looked through two different lens, but you saw one picture. Can I tell you, when you look in the Old Testament and you look in the New Testament, uh, you don't see two different pictures. You see one picture, and the theme of the Old Testament is the same theme of the New Testament, and that's that Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, has come to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, I tell you, he is the message. Uh, he's the subject. He's the author. And you look, and, and everywhere, somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus in every passage. He's there because this book is about him. Even the book of Revelation. It's not just about uh, eschatology and uh, uh, the uh, events that are going to happen in the, uh, somewhere in the future, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. But whenever I look at this, I'm thinking about God's purpose and God's timing is always right. I wonder tonight if there's something 
that used to be a burden on our heart that we prayed about and prayed about and prayed about. But somewhere along the line, we've quit praying about it. Not because we quit caring about it, because somewhere along the line, we thought we might as well quit praying about it because God's not going to answer this prayer. Or maybe God has answered it and God said no. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says yes. And sometimes he says yes, but not right now. Yeah. Amen. I wonder if there's some things tonight that we've kind of let go and we've discounted. But God says, I've heard your prayer. Which one? That prayer for your child to be saved. God says, I've heard it. And I'm going to deal with their heart. God says, I've heard your prayer. And you say, which one? That prayer that you've been praying and you prayed real hard about in the past asking me to send revival. And even though you didn't see it then, but I heard your prayer and I'm getting ready to send that revival that you prayed for. God said, I heard your prayer. You say, which one? God said, that need that you had. You say, yeah, Lord, I prayed and prayed and that need that is still there. And God says, even though that it wasn't taken care of the when you thought it should be and how you thought it should be. And I never forgot what you said, and it just wasn't the right time, but here I am now to take care of that need. Do you know everything in God's economy is about timing? Every single thing is about God's timing. And many times that we uh, we want it to yesterday, we're at, uh, so uh, accustomed to having everything at the disposal of our fingertips. Uh, and, but God doesn't operate that way. His ways are not our ways, and His timing is not our timing. But it's a coexistent book, not only a closing book and a connecting book, but coexistent. Do you know that the book of Malachi and the book of Nehemiah, uh, that they are during the same period of time? It's interesting to me uh, that uh, they're contemporaries, they're coexistent. But Nehemiah, he never mentions anything about Malachi. And Malachi never mentions anything about Nehemiah. But when you read these two books, you'll find out uh, that they convey the same truth. You say, how in the world could these two different men from two different places uh, and all this, how could they have the same message? How is it that somebody way back in the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds of years before, and somebody else later, how is it that the harmony of the new and the old goes together? You say, there's no way that this thing could just happen to be this way. This is not just a book written by men. Uh, this book has a divine author, one by, that is uh, the uh, one who is uh, uh, moving and brooding over individuals, telling them what to write, and he's in control. Uh, this book right it is divinely inspired of God. That's why you can have all these gaps of years, all these different individuals from different ways of life, uh, different uh, backgrounds, different raisings, and, and all kind of different ideas and ways of life, but God bring it all together in a harmonious book that was without any fault or any error whatsoever. Uh, this book is coexistent. Now, when it comes to Nehemiah and Malachi, that these men never mention each other, but one thing they had in common is both of these men had a burden that was given unto them of God. Nehemiah, he saw the city laying in ruins, and God gave him a burden over the condition of a place and wanted him to be instrumental in seeing that these walls be rebuilt, and God accomplished it through the burden that God gave Nehemiah. God gives a burden also to Malachi, and we go to chapter number one, and you find in verse number one that the word of God says, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, that Malachi has a burden. Uh, Nehemiah's is the condition of a place, uh, but Malachi's burden is to recall the people. It's the condition of the people. That was what God put in his heart. Uh, this book is uh, what's been referred to not only as a closing book, a connecting book, a coexisting book, but it is also a contemporary book. And what I mean by that is even though that it was written uh, many, many years ago, uh, that is just as relevant today as it was in the day that it was written in. It's just as relevant it was first delivered by the Old Testament prophet Malachi, but it still needs to be delivered today uh, by New Testament preachers because the message is still relevant today. Uh, this book, thank God, is not outdated. Amen. I thank God today that it is alive and it speaks to our heart. It's a challenging book. It calls for people of God to examine the realness of their spiritual life and to examine the sinfulness of their personal life. And the whole reason for this is to get ready for the coming of the Lord. Now, Malachi was being instructed of God to get people ready for the coming of the Lord, his first advent. But you read on down in Malachi chapter number four that he's also instructing people to get ready for the coming of the Lord. Amen. 
for his next coming. He's already came the first time. Word of God says, but when the fullness of time was come, that God sent forth his son. We read about that right on time, and the Lord's coming back uh, right on time. But we find here uh, that there's some things about this book right quick that I'm going to share with you. First of all, we see in chapter number one, verse number one, the commission of the prophet. To help you understand a little bit about Malachi and the message, we'll look at a few verses and kind of skim the surface. Uh, that we, we think about Malachi, and there's a little, just very little that we know about Malachi. As a matter of fact, the only thing that we really do know about Malachi is his name. The name Malachi means my messenger, or it means messenger of God. And that's what he was, was a messenger of God. Now when it comes to Malachi, that um, we don't know anything about his background. Uh, we don't know anything tonight about uh, his personality. Uh, we don't know about his family lineage and who he was of and what descendants and all this. We don't know about that. We don't know tonight about his accomplishments. We don't know about his failures. Uh, we don't know about his strengths. We don't know about his weaknesses. That all of a sudden, here's a man that steps out of the shadow of nowhere, and God puts him on the scene and in the spotlight, and God uses him to bring about a powerful message. Did you know I find all through the Bible that God uses common, ordinary, average individuals? Sometimes we ask the question, how could the Lord ever use somebody like me? That's the same kind of people that God's looking for to use. Those that say, why doesn't God ever use somebody like me is those that God has a hard time using. But those that said, he could really use me, he could use me. Whenever he was uh, talking to Gideon, Gideon was down the wine press and he uh, referred to Gideon as a mighty man of valor. And I'm sure when he said, uh, thou mighty man of valor, Gideon probably looked around to see who God was talking to because he didn't seem like no mighty man of valor. But God didn't see Gideon for as Gideon was, but he saw Gideon for how he was going to make him. When I think about tonight, God's not looking for people with impressive resumes. God's not looking for people tonight that has a long list of credentials. He's not looking for people tonight that has the uh, recommendations of prominent people, but he's interested in common, ordinary individuals that are yielded and surrendered and sold out to him. Amen. When I was in Bible college, I was to write a paper uh, on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and by the way, the Holy Spirit is not an it. Amen. He is an he. He is a divine member of the Trinity. Uh, he teaches, he guides, he instructs, he rebukes, he has emotions, he gets grieved, he can be quenched. Amen. Things don't have emotions. Things don't have actions, but he's not a thing, he's not an it, but he's a divine member of the Godhead. Amen. And I was studying on the Holy Spirit, and I went to one of my college professors, and he said, I've got a book that might be a help to you. He said, it's no longer in print. He said, it's by James A. Stewart. He said, it's called Heaven's Throne Gift. I took that book home and I began to read through it. And James A. Stewart, he said some things that really stuck in my heart. He said, here are some qualifications for being used of God. He said, first of all, he said, when it comes to being used of God, he said, I've come to the place where I've said, whatever God claims, he said, that I yield unto him, whatever he wants. That's what I want to give him. No matter how little or how significant it might be, he said, whatever he claims, that I yield unto him. He said, whatever I yield unto him, he always accepts it. Never does he reject it. He says, what he claims and what I yield, God feels and God makes. And whatever God makes and God feels, that God uses for his glory. And he said, that's what God's looking for is he's looking for those that he can use for his glory. God's not looking for abilities, but God is looking for availability. I was reading in the Word of God tonight, and I went to a familiar passage in 1 Corinthians, chapter number 1, verse number 26. The Word of God says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but... God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, 
and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Here's why, verse number 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him ye are in Christ Jesus, of whom of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The apostle Paul, he said, I'm the chiefest among sinners. He said, but it's by the grace of God. I am what I am. He never stood up and said, look at me. He never said, look at all these lives I've touched. He never said, look what a great ministry I've built. He never said, look what an impact that I've made upon the society that I live in. He never said, look at me. He never said, look at me. He always said, look at him. And I'm going to tell you tonight, if you ever are being filled in use of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is always, look at him. Look to Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. We find Malachi, the, uh, he's the, the messenger. Uh, God gives him a message to Israel, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Malachi was a chosen messenger. Uh, that He uh, had a message. This message was a heavy message. He speaks of it as the burden of the word of the Lord. Do you know the word burden speaks of something that's heavy? Back in those days, they would take an animal, They'd use it as a pack animal, and they'd put all these heavy packs on it, and they would call it a burden bearer, or a burden bearer, or a beast of burden would carry that heavy burden, something that's heavy, something that's heavy, something that's weighing heavy. This message that Malachi had to give to Israel was a heavy message that was laying heavy on his heart. But not only was it a heavy message, it was a heavenly message, because the Bible says the burden of the word of the Lord. This message wasn't. Malachi's message, but it was God's message. My pastor said this. He said, man, he said, God's called you to preach. He said, your ideas and opinions and your the all this, he said, it will die when you die. He said, but the word of God will live forever and ever and ever. You ever had something that you was pretty settled on, but later on in life you found out you was wrong about it? Sure. I'll tell you this. If you ever go to the Word of God and you share what the Word of God says, later on down the road, you won't have to go back and say, I was wrong about that. We might be wrong sometimes how we divide and rightly divide God's Word, but when we come down and God's Word is delivered the way God intends for it to be delivered, we won't ever have to go back and apologize because we did something wrong. There's a lot of folk out there today, and you talk to them and say, well, here's what I believe. Here's what I believe about what happens when you die. Here's what I believe this, that I, I know that some people believe this way and some believe that I take a little bit of this, a little bit of this, I mix it together, and I kind of come up with my own thing. And here's what I believe. That's their idea and their opinion. There's all kinds of theories out there today. There's all kinds of philosophies. There's all kinds of heresies. Everybody's looking for answers, and everybody says, I got the answer, I got the answer, I got the answer. But I, can I say today that I'm so comforted and I'm so glad that I don't have to rely, I don't have to rely upon human speculation because I've been given divine revelation. Matter of fact, it don't matter what I believe. It don't matter what you believe. It don't matter what others believe. What matters tonight is what God has said. Because that's where it's all going to come right down to. And many times I ask people, I said, if what you believe is not true or inaccurate based upon what God said, would you want somebody to care enough about you to share with you the truth? You won't find many people who says, oh, no, I don't want to hear that. Most people say, well, yes, okay, that's fine. Then you can take the word of God and you can show them step by step what God says. They might can argue with you and me, but they can't argue with the Word of God. They can, but God's Word will stand on its own. Amen. We find that God's message to Israel was a hard message. The message was hard. As we learn about this message, we find that this message, the reason that it was a burden is because it wasn't sent to comfort Israel, but it was sent to convict them. It wasn't a message of commendation, but it was a message of condemnation. It wasn't a message that would delight the people, but it was a message that would discomfort them and disturb them. It was a message that if it be given in many churches today, that most of the crowd wouldn't come back next Sunday. 
wasn't popular. Did you know we live in a day in a generation where many people resent? I used to say resent hard preaching, but now I say resent biblical preaching. They want health, wealth, and prosperity. Want ears tickled. Want somebody to tell them that don't you worry, you don't have to change anything in your life. Everything's just the fine, just fine the way it is. That God loves you just the way you are. Everything's going to be all right, and uh, you find the best in you, and on and on and on. And listen, I, I, I want somebody to tell me the truth, Amen. Amen. And God will always give us the truth. Uh, the Savior, thank God, He is a Savior. But I'll tell you this: He's also the great physician. You know what the great physician does? Many times in order for him to be able to salvage a life, he's got to go in and perform some operations. You know when it comes to the Savior that he's got a, he's the great physician. He's a surgeon and he uses a scalpel. And the scalpel that he uses is God's word. And he uses it to cut and remove sin and things from our life that hurts us and hinders us. Uh, you might go to the doctor and the doctor said, I found something there. And if we don't go in and remove it, it's going to hinder your life from here on forward. And you say, well, I've got confidence. Go in there and take it out. Listen, we need to have the same spiritual mindset that we do physically. And when the great physician says there's something there that needs to be removed, we ought to say, well, here I am. Take it out. That's where the healing comes in. Do you know the church is the hospital where God uses his word, the scalpel, to do a work on our hearts. Before we can ever arise with healing in our wings, sometimes sin has to be cut out. Uh, thank God for the blessings of his word, but I say thank God for the brokenness that often comes through his word. Uh, my pastor always said this. He said, I wouldn't give you two cents for a church and a pastor where everything's always right and nothing's ever, ever wrong. Because I guarantee you, if you get in God's word, you'll find out that not everything's complete order. But thank God he makes a way for things to be put straight. Now let me share with you right quick. I'm going to hurry and we're going to be done. Notice uh, that condition of the people is what's dealt with after the commission of the prophet. And the reason the message was so hard and the reason that it was so harsh is because the people's hearts have become so hardened. Uh, you remember the other night I was uh, preaching about uh, the father being the husbandman. Jesus said, I am the true vine. Uh, you are the branches. The father is the husbandman. And the uh, husbandman is one who tills the earth and referred to as a plowman. And the reason the earth has to be tilled is so that it can be prepared to receive the seed. Yeah. Did you know the harder the ground, the more plowing and tilling has to take place? The harder the heart, sometimes the harder the message. You ever notice that there's people that you talk to sometimes and you share the truth with them and it just goes in one ear right out the other ear? And sometimes you want to get them and just shake them real good and say, you're not getting this. And I'll tell you this, there's times that, that I've needed to be shaken real good. Shaken real good. There's times that my pastor got up and preached and preached and preached. And buddy, it may have dealt with the heart a little bit. But there's times that he got up and I'm telling you, he preached hard. And it wasn't pleasant. You're talking about getting your toes stepped on. You're talking about getting your heart stepped on. But it was what was needed to get somebody's attention. You know what's a shame today is you can preach on hell nowadays, and a lot of people are sit and smile through the service. People come to order chewing, chewing gum, and blowing bubbles and say they're under conviction. If God ever really deals with somebody's heart, it's not a pleasant thing. But where it's pleasant is whenever we bring it to God and say, Lord, you take it and make it new. You fix it, save this old wretched sinner. Now to see there's some announcements that God gives here. And what's interesting is he brings about a seven different announcements that are against the people and things that they were guilty of. And I want to look at those right quick. I'll run through them real quick. It won't take just a minute. And I want us to examine our own hearts as we look at these. First of all, uh, that the announcement given in chapter 1, verse number 2, was that the people were denying God's love for them. Verse number 2, God says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Can you imagine a people that God had been so good to? Asking God, where is it that you've loved us? How have you demonstrated your love to us? 
What have you done to show us that you love us? If you ever wonder about God's love, can I tell you, just take a fresh look at Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. God not only declared his love, but God demonstrated his love. And not just in the death of his son Jesus, but over and over and over again, God declares and demonstrates his love towards us. We shouldn't ever question God's love. Our adversary will scoot up and he'll say, if God really loved you, he'd do this or he wouldn't do that. I'm telling you, he's a liar tonight. God loves us. Uh, they denied his love. They despised his name. Verse number 6 in chapter number 1, he said, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord unto you, O ye priests that despise my name? And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? You know what they sound like to me? They sound like a bunch of little back talkers. They sound like people that grew up in some of our generation would have got their mouth mashed for back talking assassin. You've not loved me. Where have we not loved you? Uh, you've not honored my name. Where have we not given you honor? Can you imagine questioning God and saying, Lord, we just don't believe you're right about this. We believe you're wrong. God's never wrong. He's never, ever, ever wrong. Uh, we find here in verse number 7, not only have they denied his love and despised his name, but they've defiled his altar. Verse number 7 says, You offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? And God answers them, in that, that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible, and, ye, and if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? You know what God's saying? God says if you was giving something to the governor, you'd give him the best. But I'm your Lord. I'm your master. I'm your father. Uh, I'm all these things. And you want to bring me the second best. And you want to bring me the leftovers. He said, you've not given me honor. You've not given me glory. And listen, I'll tell you tonight, we need to always give God the very best we have to give unto him. They have defied his patience. Chapter number 2, verse number 17, uh, that we read, uh, that uh, the Lord says, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? Uh, when you say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? I wish we had time tonight to get into all these, but I just want to skim the surface. We look right quick in chapter number 3. Not only had they defied his patience and defiled the altar, despised his name and denied his love, but they have deserted his fellowship. Chapter 3, verse number 7, he says, Even from the days of your fathers, ye have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye say, Wherein shall we return? They had debated God's command. Here's one that often, often makes folk uncomfortable. Verse number eight, the Lord says, Will a man rob God? Yet he, ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? And God says, In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now. Uh, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be, enough, or be room enough to receive it. Not only was that true back then, but it's true, true today. Amen. You read lastly, in chapter number thir 3, and verse number 13, that they were despairing in his service. In verse number 13, he says, Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, What have we spoken so much against thee? You have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? You know what they're saying? They're saying we've tried to serve God, but it's all vain. It's all vanity. Uh, we've wasted our time, we've wasted our resources, we've done this and we've done that and we and it's not been worth our time, that it's all been a loss. And you know, you'll never, ever, ever do one thing for God that's going to be in vain if it's done in the right heart. That God's going to be pleased with those that's willing to give unto Him. That's why we're not to be weary in well-doing. 
The attitude of these is they're saying, we're, we're not guilty of this. We hadn't done these things. Do you know what's so sad? It was in a time when the temple had been rebuilt. The sacrifices were being offered up. The altar had been set up. A time when the feast and the fast were being observed. If you had to look at it from a human perspective, it would look like they were doing everything right. But God said, even though it looks like everything's right, there's so much going on in the heart that's not right. And they said, we're not guilty of these things. Somebody else, you're not talking to us. You know, I used to be just like everybody else whenever preacher's preaching. And boy, he start hitting on some things. And I'd look around and I'd say, you know, I wish so-and-so was here because they really need this message. You ever done that? Oh, yes. Sure you have. Sometimes who needed to be there was exactly who was there. Sometimes it wasn't for the person to the right or the person to the left or who's in front and who's behind. It was for us. I remember one of my college professors, he was invited to go to a little primitive Baptist church, and he said it was a congregation of a, a, a mostly a, 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 just a, a different group of people. And he said it when he, that there was just a different, uh, from a different background, different way of life. And he said when he got in there and he started preaching, he said there was an elderly gentleman that got up over here and said that, he said, stand a little closer, preacher. And he said, boy, that fueled my fire. He said, I started hitting on sin. He said, every time I'd hit a sin, he'd stand up and he'd stomp his feet. He'd say, stand a little closer, preacher. He said, I started hitting on every sin there was. He said, I was a preaching on everything under the sun. He said, I loaded my shotgun and I emptied both barrels on the whole congregation. He said, boy, he's a love net. He was a fuel in the fire. He's a feeding it. And he said, I got to talking about adultery. And he said, this man had to be in his later 80s. And he said, whoa, preacher. He said, you're getting a little too close here. He said, who would ever thought somebody in those stages of life would be dealing with that kind of problem? It reminds us tonight that none of us have arrived yet. But thank God he knows what we need. If I had more time tonight, I'd share with you some things that wasn't just about the people in the pews. It was about the priests in the pulpits. The corrupt leadership led to corrupt generation. This morning we talked about the king's 1 Kings chapter number 15, a whole list of corrupt kings, and they caused the people of Israel to sin. Did you know the saying is everything rises and falls on leadership? I understand that all of us have a personal accountability to God and that we can't blame something on somebody else, but I will tell you this, there's a lot of folk that would be in a whole lot different boat if the leadership was right with God. Now, I'm not standing up here saying tonight that I have arrived and I've got it figured out. But what I am saying tonight is I need your prayers. And I need you to ask God to lift me up and to help me to rightly divide his word. To help me not only to preach his word, but to be able to practice what I preach. That I could live a life that's pleasing in his sight. You know, there have been a lot of people that have fallen because they've been under somebody that's fallen. There have been a lot of congregations that's been hurt because of something that the pastor had going on in his life. Not only that true for the pastor, the Sunday school teachers, the deacons, but it's also true for every single church member. Did you know you can be either a stepping block or a stumbling stone to somebody that you may not even know that's watching your life? That's why it's so important that we ask God to help us to ever be what he'd have us to. I tell you tonight, God knows what we need. I praise his name. The message is not always an easy one, but if God sends it, it's always a right one. And what's most important is how we respond to it, how we respond to it. Let's all stand our feet tonight.